concrete. It's foundational to our way of life. I need more water. How about it, guys? Roads, offices, playgrounds, homes. This master mixture makes them all possible. Every concrete pro has their own secrets to the perfect pour. We're going to have to break them, I guess. Cut off that mixer. But whose concrete know-how reigns supreme? To find out, we built the ultimate proving ground, where we'll pit top competitors against each other to push concrete and themselves to the limit. Get ready, because when you enter the concrete coliseum, you either cement your name in history or crack under the pressure. This is Concrete Combat. Yeah, um, my name is Dave Jackson. I'm the senior brand manager at Sacrete, so manage all of our advertising, marketing, communications, uh, obviously any content development, including uh, Concrete Combat. Been with the company for two and a half years, I guess, and I've been working with Mr. Tharp for uh, the better part of that. And, you know, we've been kind of gestating this, this concept for a couple of years now, and uh, we're finally able to get it executed this year and uh, are thrilled about it. I'm Dirk Tharp um, from the ready mix concrete industry and in block grew up in that stuff. And I've been with Sackcrete or Old Castle for five years. In that capacity, I started off as the as a Sackcrete expert. And then we, uh, as my role has evolved into more of a company trainer, uh, that's where Dave and I partnered up. And we have learn how to pour a slab or how to repair, you know, damaged concrete. So yeah. knowing that there is always room for, to teach these guys something that, you know, um, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, absolutely. But we needed this sort of a, a roundabout way to, to get at doing that. This, your standard, here's how to use sacrete wasn't going to do it. So we were, you know, working on sort of ideating an, an idea that, combined both entertainment with education and sort of sneakily put in some of that, that product ex and project expertise that we were never gonna get these guys to consume otherwise. You know, the, the concrete trade is just criminally underrepresented and, and I think under celebrated. And there's something, really something to be said for, we wanted to be the ones who tied ourselves to a respect and an honoring and just, you know, a, a representation of the trade and, and, you know, all the great work and, and expertise that goes into it. So it started with that concept and over the course of a year and a half or maybe two years almost, um, you know, figuring out what those projects were going to be, finding a partner to really help us bring it all together, obviously the contestants, the judges, um, and then shot it for, took about a week and uh, back in, what was it, April, Dirk? And- um, Do you guys have all the episodes already shot? Yep, we, we, uh, we shot everything over the course of a week. So we flew everybody in. It was, that was a, a pretty, that was a long week. In order to minimize the amount of time that we were asking for the contestants to be off the job, which is obviously really challenging for them. You know, asking for a couple hours is tough. Asking for a day or two is even, harder, um, but there was no way we were gonna ask these guys to come back two, if not three times if they were the, the finalists. So uh, jammed, it, jammed it all together. Dirk, when they approached you about being a judge, I'm sure you felt a, a certain pressure to say yes, but I'm assuming you also have such a presence on the screen that it, it seems very natural for you and you said you were a trainer. What was it like for them to approach you and what was your decision process in saying yes? Thanks. I notice you keep wetting it. What is that for? SSD, saturate surface dry. You want the block to take as much moisture in as it can. So when you start applying your materials, it doesn't dry out your material before it has a chance to cure out. Very good textbook answer. Oh, it, it was nothing like that. It was, it was uh, a phone call from Dave. He said, I've been talking to a studio and we've got this crazy idea. I wanted to run it by you. It was just, we got this idea and you can be a central character in it, um, but we want you to help us develop it. So it, it, it was no pressure on me. It was, it was a, a, an honor to be asked, but it meant so much more in that Dave and I, I, he did so much more work than I did. I'm not saying that, but it was an honor to be asked in the inception to help plan out what are we going to do for these episodes? What, would, what is something that we're seeing with contractors? 
We wanted it to be entertaining, but we but we knew what we were up to, which yeah. is a commercial combined with entertainment, and most importantly, showing correct practices and underlining incorrect practices, which is something you never get out in the real world. So yeah. it, 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 there was nothing on me. It was just, uh, hey, do you want to be part of this? If so, we need you to think about how we're going to do it. And so I was on board from, from that first phone call. I was excited. So in terms of actually choosing the products or projects that you guys were going to do, because there's a lot of things, obviously, you can do with concrete. The yeah. first few episodes, you have a retaining wall with cement blocks. Second, you do resurfacing of a sidewalk. I know you have pouring a slab plan, fence post plan. Mm -hmm. How did you come about choosing these projects and why? And then sort of, let me tack on a, a third question here. In terms of the timing you give them to complete these challenges, what was it and how did you determine that as well? So this was, <clears throat> that was really uh, probably the biggest challenge for us um, for, for a couple of reasons. Obviously you want things that are, are representative and common enough to, to be meaningful. You know, we didn't want to go out in left field and, you know, make a concrete flower pot because it's like who cares yeah. you know we, we wanted things that were real life projects that were you know meaningful and that we had something to to say and you know hopefully teach about the other big thing is that well I guess there's two more big things the second thing was scale Sacrete lives in sort of the special project size range to where we're not going to go and pour a driveway. You're not going to pour a basement with, with bags of concrete. And it had to be done, you know, within the, the confines of a soundstage. And then third is, was really about timing. What can we get done? You know, what, what sort of projects can we shoot in one day? Because mm -hmm. that, that was the biggest limitation we had six episodes and six days and no wiggle room there. You'll see, I think the, the very final episode we're going to air, the semifinal challenge is actually pouring a pretty good size slab. I think it's like a six by six square and, you know, small project in the grand scheme of things, but that takes four hours start to finish. And, you know, when you're trying to squeeze in all of the, the, set up and the interviews and, and all the talking heads and stuff that was that one was pushing the bounds of what we could do so really we were looking for projects that that realistically took 30 minutes to an hour so when we designed each challenge we're thinking what can we fit in there what can be done in a reasonable amount of time but then more importantly dave and i did the mental exercise to figure out what's something valuable mm -hmm. that's not just every day that we can show can be done in smaller projects using this type of material. So we were, we were looking at more intriguing ways mm -hmm. to, to lead you into how to really get some good repairs done that maybe you, you or you're, as a contractor, you wanted to try and you're not a concrete guy. So we aimed it at that to make interest, interesting things to do and as each episode goes, you see it gets more and more interesting as far as what they're challenged to do. So an example of that, episode one, you have them do a retaining wall. <clears throat> one thing I like is that there's two different methods. You have the dry stack and then you have a sort of a traditional mortar. When the teams come in, do they have an option for what kind of method they're going to use or is it assigned to them? Oh, no, it's not assigned. Do you agree with that, Dave? Yeah, uh, we, we essentially, we uh, let them pick. Um, obviously, there's only so many options you have, and yeah. we, did, we did ask them to, to choose two different yeah. sides. You know, in episode block. one, for sure, mm -hmm. because you're either going to build a block wall or you're going to dry stack a block wall. Yeah. But as it evolved, it really was left up to them. It's like, all this stuff is for y'all. We had to remind them, didn't we, Dave? We would remind yeah. them several times, use everything around you. Well, we kind of see that in episode two because they use the uh, flow code. Mm-hmm. And that was something I was really interested in because it didn't seem as though they had worked with it very much in the I don't past. Within three minutes of putting that product down, you could tell it wasn't concrete. You know, it's just, it, it was different. What, what are the properties of the flow code? And for someone who watched, who, who you know, it was obviously gummy and sticky, the, 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 uh, his squeegee had a little bit of problems. What is flow code and how do you best work with it? When you're watching me as a judge, 
the frustration that I'm trying to hold back there in that specific instance, because I've had people go, ooh, you're being the Simon Cow of the show. The cons, those materials cost double what a mortar bag, if not more. And the other con is that dry stack application is very limited. And I end up being that character most of the time, but it wasn't fake. I challenge you to go out and do this yourself. It's this simple. You mix it by the water it says on the bag. You pour it out, you place it with the squeegee, you leave it alone, it tightens up, you broom it, you don't touch it again, mist it after it starts drying. That's it. Now, that was my frustration. It is such an easy product. It's not easy. You got to have people to help you. Don't, don't think I'm saying that. Yeah. But it's science. And if you just do what science says, you have a good result. Those young men kept working it, brooming it, smoothing it, brooming it. And, and I'm just back there shaking my head. So the product, I mean, it is, it is a cementitious product. It just has a lot of um, flow enhancers and, and, uh, pump and plasticizers in it. So it, it is, it, it's not self-leveling, but it does flow. Yeah. So they had the consistency right. They had the mix procedure right. It would, to Dirk's point, it was just that overworking it. Because what it's supposed to do, absolutely, is pour it out in stripes it sort of settles out and flows you are just using the uh, the squeegee to sort of help it along a little mm -hmm. bit james what what you saw then what was freaking them out is a cementious product like that as it settles it forces out all the little micro bubbles and they come to the top mm -hmm. but you leave them alone because they pop themselves and then it becomes a nice smooth gray. Yep. And the problem is they kept seeing those little dots and they were freaking out going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And they just kept working it and working it and working it. And to be fair, Dirk, we did spend some time after after they both picked their, their respective direction, we did spend some time with those guys and like, all right, here's some things to remember. And I, I was standing there with you and you said, Pour it, place it, <laughs> leave it alone. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it, it was live. That was their mistake live because yep. it's not like we didn't tell them. Guys, I'm going to tell you this three times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pour it, place it, leave it alone, broom it, don't touch it again. Yeah. And then and then moisten it, right? Keep it moist yeah. while, while the other guys are over here still trying to finish and you'll beat them. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they just did what young people do. Because they were done in, in 20 minutes. There probably is a unique urgency when you're on a set like that to just, you know, like, I got to go fast. Uh, I'm oh, trying yeah. to do what I yeah. can, but your mind's probably blank. And I'm sure it's hard to remember all the directions. Is there anything over the course of that week when you guys are, you know, watching these separate teams using these different met methods to the same projects with, you know, somewhat different materials? Is there anything new you guys learned about concrete at large or your product specifically? that you didn't know before. I, I tell you, Dave will jump in on this and I'm gonna go ahead and throw my first one out. I am a, never stopped being amazed at how good the, the most antique product there works, sand mix. Sand mix. That concrete sand mix is just phenomenal and yet nobody ever challenges it. You know, they, they, they think it's just old school and they don't try anything and to see Mike jump out there and put a beautiful, beautiful top that looked like showroom finish, and yet he was on the clock. I'm telling you, man, that that's what I learned was just more and more respect for the one of the more rudimentary products we make. Yeah. What do you think, Dave? What, what that you, that what was that was the big one because you know, Dirk, you and I were having a lot of conversations about whether or not to even make sand mix topping and, and optional that mm -hmm. those guys try, and you know. Um, Mike was like, yeah. yeah, I tried to talk him out of it, actually, and I was wrong. I was Wait, why is that? I remember you saying that uh, the consistency of the Samex obviously is going to be key. Is there any tips you can give for, for mixing that type of concrete? Or, and then also, obviously, why you had uh, suggested maybe not do it. I, I was worried. It's not, I was simply worried because typically when one does a topping, you are doing something... Uh, you know, you're using modern technology with thinner materials that have a lot of admixtures built in them. And, and so I just thought, you know what, this one's going to blow up in our face. It's not going to stick right. Something's going to go wrong. And I couldn't have been more wrong because by using 
bonding agent as the mixing water. It made that material into a rich mortar mix. It really felt like mortar mix you would lay a block or brick with, mm -hmm. but yet it turned into concrete. It was fascinating. So uh, that was one time I'm glad I listened to Dave and didn't argue <laughs> and win because uh, I was totally wrong about that product. And I thought the other one would have just whipped it. I thought there was no contest, Flow Coat would eat its lunch, but that just goes to show. It's all about taking your time and paying attention to instructions, which obviously Concrete Mike did and the young men. Just, I think you're right. I think the, the camera and everything got them flustered and mistakes started happening. Yep. What was really interesting to me is how those little mistakes just organically happened because there was, you know, early on in the development, we, we had the question, or, you know, we're going down the road of, do we need to tell these guys what products to use? Are we pre-selecting who's going to win? Do we need to, you know, have them demonstrate, you know, do we have them use the same method and one team gets it right and one team gets it wrong and it's almost scripted like that. And, um, you know, we, we worked through that being a, a awful idea. Um, mm -hmm. And again, at the, at the potential danger of not knowing how these were going to turn out yeah. and could blow up in our face or because we let them go totally off script. And this, the, uh, the next episode that's coming out is a great example of that. Those mm -hmm. guys went completely off script. Mm -hmm. uh, but like the, 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 we were able in every single challenge to pick out little things that, you know, we c almost couldn't have scripted. It, it felt, it feels, I think it shows when you watch the show, you do get a genuine feeling like that person really did win. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you get the sense this is so many, so many of the uh, home improvement shows, the reputation is, you know, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. When you're watching that, you can tell we don't know who's going to win either. It's not, it's not pre-cooked. I feel the crippling paranoia setting in on me as the bright lights are on me and you can feel the heat and the pressure start. I mean, even when you pulled the side off of uh, Mike's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was honestly nervous for him because he seemed nervous too. All right, well, now that we've looked at the top, got to check the side. I want to see how that, that, that line went with putting the topping on. Excuse me, y'all, and I'll take off this form. I didn't know that was part of the competition. We didn't worry about the edge. <laughs> yeah, he said, I didn't know you were going to do that. <laughs> Surprise. In terms of going off script, and because this is so real, I'm sure you've been around the industry long enough, and, and you as well, Dave, to know that, you know, these guys are generally by themselves when they're working mm -hmm. um, with their friends, and conversations can use words that maybe aren't TV appropriate, or at least on the yeah. job sites I've been in. If, if you're not scripting these guys, I'm assuming you give them some sort of prompt, like, hey, let's keep the language, whatever. But when you're working, you know, maybe something goes wrong, you can't help yourself. Was that a challenge on set? In the next episode. Yeah, <laughs> I wanna, let's just be clear that the only script in that entire, entire show, episode after episode, is uh, our hostess. Brittany had to learn lines and sit there and do them over and over and over. The rest of us were just total 100% ad lib. And we would forget that we were mic to that degree that I would sit here arguing and Dave would jump up raising hell at something. And I'm like, how do you know I said that? <laughs> so it was totally, totally real. They don't get carried away. They, they, they're enough gentlemen yeah. to realize yeah. this isn't gutter talk. So bricklayers, Cement masons, a lot of people are reporting shortages um, of those particular subs. And so when you, both of you think of the future of concrete and concrete work, are you thinking we need to make products more efficient so it's easier for, you know, less hands to be in the kitchen and also fewer mason specialists like a remodeler can, can do it? Or is it more of we need to put what quality comes out of a specialist on, on, on stage and on showcase so that people start to reconnect with the real value of what a Mason brings. When I was young, there was no internet. We had the same conversation. There's a scarcity of brick Masons. What are we gonna do? The good news and bad news is combined. It has nothing to do with our industry. Mm -hmm. the, the, the associations that handle masonry 
concentrate very, very heavily on lobbying, working with Congress, and putting together high school programs for young people to learn those trades. And they have high school contests still to this day when, that where, where they'll go lay block walls and win awards and all that. So that industry is working on that really hard. The people who have failed in, in chasing that industry really is more in the, is in the professional concrete arena, which once again, we're in the supply side. Mm -hmm. We can't be blamed for that. But the disassociation of, of all of these guys that do concrete work is eating the industry up a little bit in that, you know, you don't see them teaching high school. You see them teaching masonry. Rarely do they teach concrete. So I'm, I am afraid for that future. We just have to get back to showing there's honor working with your hands. Mm -hmm. Everything in life is not a computer. Too many kids are taught if you don't go to college, you're a failure. And the reality is when I look at a plumber, a mason, or a concrete finisher who runs his crew or owns his crew, they make way more money than most people that graduated from college because there's a scarcity and a high pay that goes with these type jobs. Eric, I, think, I think you really, <laughs> I was trying to find anything to add beyond what, what you had said, because I think you were, you're spot on. It's not the products because again, our, our products are really uh, components at best of, of larger construction. Uh, if you're building, you know, masonry wall, you need the block and there's only sort of one way to do that. So I, I think that there is, yeah, it's it really, all we can do is continue making good product from a product side. Um, but Dirk's, I think, right on the money. And that's the way I feel is that it's, it's the talent and it's the, it's the people that we really need to continue developing and, and rewarding and respecting and, and uh, you know, representing folks like, you know, Mike Rowe, I think are, are really, really big into this movement of let's represent the trades. Let's reinvigorate the trades and, and, you know, put some respect back into, uh, into that, that work. Um, so this is just sort of our, I would say our small way of, of doing the exact same thing where it's, you know, we know concrete, is out, it's hard work. It's not sexy. It's not, well, it's kind of fun, but um, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily what most folks think of as exciting, but it's, um, you know, there's, there's a skill in art craft and, and a real, real meaning behind it. What can we expect from the finale at the World of Concrete? Spectacle. <laughs> uh, starting in 2020, we really changed the you know, the level that we exhibit at that show at. Um, we've got a 40 by 90 space, which is, you know, second to only a couple of other monster players and a, <laughs> uh, and a booth like, like that you've seen nothing like before. A lot going on in there. Again, very educationally focused, but on the third day of, uh, of the show, we're going to strip the booth pretty much down to, to bare bones so we can build the set in there and, um, you know, put some seating and bleachers up and it's wow. going to be, uh, it's going to be a whole experience. And we're, we're, uh, you know, just one more shout out to Brittany. I think, you know, she again came in cold in terms of knowing about concrete. So I know Dirk, you spent a lot of time with her. We, we had a lot of, uh, you know, pre meetings with her kind of walking her through some, some concrete education and then, Obviously, every challenge, he was like, all right, let's sit down for an hour and really go through the things that we're going to be looking for here. So, I, you know, I, I personally think she did a phenomenal job. And, and she let it be nat coming off very, very. She let it be natural, which is yeah. what what I was hunting when we were picking that person was somebody that didn't pretend to be a contractor. I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I thought that did not play. And, and she was the one who didn't take that approach. I think she has that professional host acumen that gives mm -hmm. the show a sense of, you know, this isn't just a concrete company putting together a little game show for a, 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 a commercial. This is, you know, a legit endeavor to show off some real concrete skills. Yep. So you did a great job. Yep. Um, but Dave and Dirk, thank you so much, both of you for taking your time and also putting together that show just for everyone. 
uh, who wants to learn more about concrete. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much for having us.